Hey everyone, I'm Matt Dolan with Dolan Divorce Lawyers in Connecticut. And today what I'm going to talk about are the factors that the court may consider when determining what is in the best interest of the child. So whenever the court is making custody decisions, whether it's legal custody, physical custody, visitation, they have to base that decision on what is in the best interest of the child. So obviously, best interest of the child is a very vague, you know, not specific term that you don't really know what it means. And, you know, the judges ultimately have a lot of wiggle room as to what, you know, how they determine what is in the best interest of the child. But there are certain statutory factors that the court can consider in making that determination. So I'm going to share my screen to show you the relevant statute. So it is Connecticut General Statute Section 46B-56, specifically subsection C, that lists the statutory factors. So what that says is in making or modifying any order as provided in subsection A and B of this section. So basically, whenever making or modifying any custody order, whether it's legal custody or physical custody, the court shall consider the best interest of the child. So they have to consider the best interest of the child. And in doing so, they may consider, but shall not be limited to one or more of the following factors. So they may consider. So they don't have to consider every factor on this list. Um, they may consider them and they're not limited to the factors on this list. So they can consider, you know, obviously every custody situation is different. And, you know, there can be some pretty unique circumstances that, you know, the Connecticut legislature maybe didn't anticipate in coming up with this list. So the court can go outside this list in, you know, determining what is in the best interest of the child. So just to briefly, you know, we'll go through each of the factors that the court may consider. Uh, so the first one is the physical and emotional safety of the child. So obviously, you know, in determining what custody arrangement is best, the court will consider the physical and emotional safety of the child. They'll also, number two, consider the temp temperamental and developmental needs of the child. They will look at three, the capacity and disposition of the parents to understand and meet the needs of the child. So, you know, obviously every parent is different. People are different. And, you know, they're going to take into consideration which parent is more capable of, you know, meeting the needs of a child, you know, whether it's a normal child, you know, normal healthy child or a child with particular you know, special needs or maybe a no emotional needs. They're going to look at which parent you know, is most capable of meeting the needs of that child. Number four, any relevant and material information obtained from the child, including the informed preferences of the child. So, you know, they can use, you know, the court in determining, you know, and it's not just the court, uh, you know, a guardian ad litem or family relations might be making a recommendation as to what they deem is in the best interest of the child. And they are also, you know, looking at these factors. So, you know, they will consider information that they obtain from the child and they, you know, depending on the age of the child, they may consider the preferences of the child. You know, a lot, a question that a lot of people ask is at what age can my child decide whether they want to live with, you know, mom or dad or, you know, one of the two parents. There is no set age. There is no bright line rule. It's just, you know, kind of a, you know, every judge is different, um, but it's just... Obviously, common sense dictates that the older the child is, the more likely it is that the court is going to consider that child's preferences in determining, you know, what is in the best interest of the child. Um, you know, the court's obviously also going to consider the wishes of the child's parents as to custody. So, you know, if you have a trial or you're, you know, and both parents are on the same page that the mom should have primary physical custody of the child, the court's going to take that into consideration in making its orders. Um, you know, the court's going to look at the past and current interaction and relationship of the child with each parent, the child's siblings, and any other person who may significantly affect the best interest of the child. So, 
you know, obviously, depending on the custody situation, the child's going to be living more or less with one parent. So they're going to consider the interaction relationship of that child and that parent um, who they would be living with. And they're also, you know, there might be siblings who are living with one parent or the other. So they're going to consider the relationship of the child in question, you know, their relationship with their siblings or anybody else, you know, who might, you know, live in the house or live nearby, you know, each one of the parents. Seven, the court's going to look at the willingness and ability of each parent to facilitate and encourage such continuing parent child relationship between the child and the other parent as is appropriate, including compliance with any court orders. So what that means is, you know, let's, I'll give you an example. So let's say there's two parents and one of the parents is a total jerk and tries to alienate the child from the other, um, you, know, you know, tries to talk poorly about the child, tries to encourage them not to spend time with the other parent. So that's the one parent who's the, we'll call him the bad parent. Then there's the good parent uh, who, you know, is more supportive of the relationship, you know, maybe recognizes the flaws of that other party, but says, you know, despite, you know, despite, you know, that person's flaws, we'll call the bad parent, the father in this example, despite dad's flaws, I still feel that it's important for my children to have a relationship with uh, their father. So the court's going to look at that. And, you know, generally speaking, they're more likely to give the child more time, you know, have the, the parent who is more supportive of the relationship with the other parent have primary physical custody of the child, you know, because obviously if the alienating parent, if the parent who does not support the relationship with the child or children has primary physical custody, that's a big problem where the, you know, the, the parent who doesn't do that alienating, like how much are they really going to see their kids? Their, you know, their relationship is going to be quite strained. So that's what the court's really looking at when looking at factor number seven. Number eight, any manipulation by or course of behavior of the parents in an effort to involve the child in the parent's dispute. So the courts are not, you know, particularly, they don't look favorable, favorably on any manipulation of children, you know, tried to put them in the middle of a dispute between parents. It kind of ties into number seven that we just talked about. So they're going to, you know, the court's going to look more favorably on a parent who is able to separate the children and insulate them from the conflict that goes on between the two parents, you know, if there if it is a high conflict situation. Number nine, the, the ability of each parent to be actively involved in the life of the child. So, you know, let's take, you know, one parent's a workaholic, uh, you know, they work 80 hours a week. Well, they really can't be all that involved in the life of the child. So they're probably not going to get you know, primary physical custody of the child. And, you know, in in figuring out, you know, visitation orders or the parenting plan, the court's going to look at, okay, well, in allocating time to a parent, they're going to look at whether or not the parent actually has the ability to spend that time with their child. Number 10, the child's adjustment to his or her home, school, and community environments. So, you know, in looking at custody orders, they're going to look at the abil the child's ability to adjust to a new environment if, you know, if the court's looking at potentially putting them into a new environment, or if the child is already in a certain environment, they're going to look at that child's adjustment into that community and school and probably, you know, if they're well settled in that environment, they're probably going to be less likely to want to change that school's environment or that child's environment. Um, you know, and again, that's one factor. It's not like if the, you know, it's not like if the child is in one environment, they're not going to change it. It's just that's one factor that is considered in the in the equation. Uh, number 11. So the court may consider the length of time that the child has lived in a state and satisfied in a stable and satisfactory environment and the desirability of maintaining continuity in such environment provided the court may consider favorably 
a parent who voluntarily leaves the child's family home, pendente lite, so while, you know, while the case is going on, in order to alleviate stress in the household. So this kind of goes to what I was saying in the answer prior. You know, the court's going to be kind of inclined to maintain the status quo, you know, assuming it's a stable environment. So if the child's in a stable and satisfactory environment, you know, the court's going to find it desirable, most likely, to maintain that continuity and not uproot the child. With that said, you know, the court's going to give credit to a parent who leaves the house in order to keep the peace. So, you know, if, you know, mom and dad are living under the same roof and it's just they're fighting a lot and it's a toxic environment and one party is the, you know, takes the high road and says, you know, this, this environment, you know, by leaving the house, you know, I'm really potentially jeopardizing my custody of the child as far as keeping their continuity of living with me. But, you know, I think it's more important for them to be, to not be in this high conflict environment, you know, as much as I'd love to, you know, maintain leverage over having primary physical custody in the future, I'm going to leave this situation because it's not good for my kids to be in you know, witnessing all this fighting between me and my spouse, you know, the court, the court may consider favorably that parent who voluntarily leaves the family home and, you know, not necessarily put so much weight on, you know, maintaining the status quo. If the parent left the house in order to, um, you know, preserve calm in the house. So that's number 11. Uh, number 12, the, the stability of the child's existing and proposed residences or both. So this is, again, somewhat similar to what we already talked about. So, well, yes and no. So, you know, the courts basically just look, you know, they want they want to know that the child's going to be living in a stable household. So what that means, I mean, you know, if one parent has a history of moving around a whole lot, you know, that's not necessarily that stable of a household environment um, if somebody has been moving around quite a bit or you know the st you know a co it's not just the physical location you know it can be unstable if there's a lot of a lot of fighting or people coming in and out of the you know it's not a calm stable environment you know the court's going to consider that in making its custody determinations 13, the mental and physical health of all individuals involved, so that's the parents, the child, et cetera, except that a disability of a proposed custodial parent or other party in and of itself shall not be determinative of custody unless the proposed custodial arrangement is not in the best interest of the child. So, you know, the court's going to look at the health of everybody. So, you know, the, if the child's unhealthy, they're going to, you know, take that into consideration, determining whether or not one parent is more capable of, you know, supporting that child through their health concerns. Or, you know, if one parent has a disability themselves or has health issues, you know, they're going to look at, you know, they're going to look at whether those health issues get in the way of that parent's ability to parent. So, you know, they're not just, you know, they try not to hold disabilities against people, um, you know, which is why it says a, a uh, the disability in and of itself shall not be determinative of custody. So they try not to, whenever possible, hold the disability. But I think the reality, you know, from a common sense perspective, sometimes a disability is interferes with a person's life to such a degree that it impacts their ability to parent a child. Well, if it's impact, you know, if it's such a disability that it prevents them from properly parenting a child, the court is going to take that into consideration in determining what arrangement is in the best interest of the child. You know, the court's going to consider or may consider the child's cultural background. So, you know, if the child is living in, you know, a, a particular culture here in Connecticut, um, you know, are they really going to, are they really going to uproot the child and put them into a completely different culture, whether it's in another country or somewhere, somewhere else? So that it, or, you know, religious, uh, religious environment, if the family, 
raised, you know, the child and it was, you know, important to the parents to raise the child under a certain religion. And then, you know, the parent, you know, one of the parents is talking about moving that child to a place where that religion that everybody agreed to in the fat past was part of the child's culture. And, you know, there's a new environment that that culture is not really possible. You know, the court's going to take that into consideration or they may take that into consideration. Um, number 15, the effect of the child, the, the effect on the child of the actions of an abuser, if any domestic violence, as defined in 46B-1, has occurred between the parents or between a parent and another individual or the child. So basically, if there's any kind of domestic violence history, uh, you know, on behalf of one of the parents or maybe somebody, uh, you know, who lives with one of the parents, you know, whether it's their significant other, if there's any domestic violence or abuse concerns, the court is going to take that into consideration, whether the abuser, you know, abused the child in the past, or maybe abused somebody else that, you know, the court's going to look at that and take that into consideration. Um, you know, in 16 is somewhat similar, uh, whether the, you know, the court may consider whether the child or a sibling of the child has been abused or neglected, as defined in section 46b-120. So if there's any history of abuse that can be tied to one parent or that parent's environment, the court is going, you know, may take that into consideration. And then finally, number 17, whether the party satisfactorily completed participation in a parenting edu education program established pursuant to section 46B-69B, the court is not required to assign any weight to any of the factors that it considers, but shall articulate the basis for its decision. So, you know, there's a parenting education program that everybody's supposed to take shortly after the initiation of a custody proceeding. Um, you know, so this is an easy one to complete. You know, if you're looking to get uh, custody, just take the parenting education program, you know, get that done so that it can't have be held against you in a uh, custody proceeding. Um, so again, and, you know, it's, it's time talked about here, the court is not required to assign any weight to any of the factors that it considers. So it, it doesn't have to assign, you know, percentages or really you know, it doesn't have to consider all these factors, um, but the court shall articulate the basis for its decision. So, you know, usually the court, well, the court has to, they shall articulate why they make a decision in determining what is in the best interest of the child. You know, and they have to look at, you know, they should point out what, what of these factors or factors beyond this list they considered in making their custody determination. So those are the basics of, uh, you know, the best interests of the child and the factors that are considered by the court. Um, so as usual, if you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to our office at any time.